Well, brothers and sisters, today we are starting part three already of our series on the gospel according to Mark. And uh, interestingly, part three means we're starting chapter two, which uh, may sound a little bit uh, counterintuitive, except when you remember that we, uh, we started with uh, largely an introduction to Mark and a little bit of chapter one, and then we went into the rest of uh, chapter one last week. This week, we are going to cover the whole of chapter two. So it's a lot of, uh, a lot of reading to do. Uh, I mean, for Mark, Mark is, like I said before, not a particularly long gospel, but uh, it is a whole chapter. So I would invite you to open up your scriptures or follow along on the screen as we read through uh, Mark chapter two. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they make an, made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier? To say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone. And they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. <coughs> Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, How is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot, so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the new piece would pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst their skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look! Why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, 
Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated, consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, I've entitled this part of the sermon series, Forgiveness, Healing, and Joy. And we're going to go through those things because each of those things is here in uh, clear, uh, clear and obvious truth. We're looking, uh, of course, right away at uh, Jesus spending time in Capernaum and forgiving the sins of the paralyzed man. And, and this, of course, creates a bunch of con con uh, controversy because the Pharisees say, oh, no, 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 you can't do that. Only, only God can forgive sins. And, of course, they don't... They don't know that Jesus is the Son of God, one with the Father and the Spirit, the triune God. But Jesus, Jesus demonstrates his authority, and by implication, he makes it clear that, that really he and the Father are one, and that he does have the authority to forgive sin and to heal in God's name. And then we move on, of course, to Jesus eating with Levi, calling Levi and eating with the sinners there. And we're going we're gonna to pause there a little bit because these first two stories are linked uh, quite closely in a lot of ways. And, and they... they they are like the forgiveness and healing part sort of all together, but there's joy suffused within them as well, of course. But in these two passages, you see that there are two kinds of sickness that Jesus is dealing with. In, in the first case, Jesus is dealing with the sickness of the spirit, the sinfulness of the paralyzed man, and also the sickness that he has where he is paralyzed. The, the, whatever, whatever caused his, uh, his reality of being paralyzed, that is the sickness that he is dealing with there. And in the second one, he is dealing pretty much exclusively with what the Pharisees would sort of call a moral sickness or uh, that sinfulness. And there are important things for us to note here. Uh, well, of course, obviously, the power of God, and once again, how Mark is describing that Jesus is indeed the Son of God through his works and his words, proving that he has not only the power to heal, but also the authority to forgive sins. But also, we see Jesus once again modeling how to fish for people. Remember, we talked about this during part two, right? The fishing techniques. And we got to remember that throughout the whole book of Mark, Jesus is fishing for people and likewise teaching his disciples how to fish for people. And it is so interesting and so important that we have Jesus calling Levi a tax collector who is, you know, even lower on the social status rungs, uh, the social status ladder than, than the fishermen are. Uh, Jesus calls Levi, who is a, a, a dreaded and hated tax collector who was even considered kind of a traitor among other Jewish people, Levi, Jesus calls with the same sort of words that he uses for Simon and Andrew, and the same sort of words that he uses for, uh, for James and John, 
follow me, Jesus says. And Levi, just like them, immediately stops what he's doing. He's sitting at the tax collector's booth, hoping to catch some people and get some taxes or whatever. He's sitting right there, and he stops it immediately and gets up to follow Jesus. <laughs> not only that, but we read in other Gospels that not only does Levi uh, host Jesus for dinner, but also then he commits to giving back not only what he, <clears throat> what he stole from other people, but also, you know, reimbursing them more than he needed to, paying back for them, compensating them for some of their loss. You know, we need to pause for a second and explain or remind ourselves what tax collectors were in those days. So tax collectors in those days were, were people who were basically contracted by the Roman authorities to uh, gather tax from the local populations throughout the empire. So what would happen is that <clears throat> the Romans would basically throw open contracts and <clears throat> the tax collectors, the people who, uh, you know, thought they could get a good living out of that, would basically contract with the Roman government authorities to do the collecting. And it wasn't like today where, you know, you have these huge forms and you've got all kinds of calculations and you've got to make sure that you've figured it all out accurately. And theoretically, everybody ought to be paying, you know, uh, their fair share of taxes, theoretically. <clears throat> In those days, it was basically whatever the tax collector could get out of people, that's what he would go for. And so Matthew or Levi, for example, he would sit there and he would uh, use his wily wits and he would try and assess the person uh, with whom he was speaking and say, well, what can I get out of this guy? And a certain amount of that had to go to the Roman authorities, but then Matthew, Levi, got to keep the rest of it for himself. And, and so the people of Israel, the Israelites, the Jewish people at the time, had good reason uh, in a lot of ways to consider a guy like Levi uh, a pretty scummy guy. Because not only did he try and, and get as much money from the people as he could and skim as much of it off the top as he could, but he also was doing it for the, the people who were oppressing and ruling over the, the people of Israel who, who really didn't want that, right? They never thought to themselves, oh, yay, Rome, Right? I mean, maybe some did, but for the most part, the people of Israel wanted to be their own sovereign people in their own sovereign nation. They didn't want these foreign powers ruling over them. And so a tax collector was not only scummy because he was scooping off of the top and getting as much as he could off of uh, poor people who were trying to make a living. He was also scummy because he was a traitor to his own people working for the foreign oppressors. And so when Jesus calls Levi, Jesus is calling one of the lower echelons of Jewish society, to say the least. And that's that moral sickness, that sinfulness, that the uh, Pharisees are pointing out. And so, too, with the paralyzed person, although the paralyzed person wasn't necessarily trying to skim off the top and wasn't necessarily a traitor to the nation of Israel, in those days, it was pretty much assumed that if you were sick, if you were crippled, if you were deformed, if you, if you had a, a disability, then that was because either you sinned or your parents sinned or something sinful and yucky happened to cause God to judge you in this particular way. And so the people uh, around Jesus would have looked at this paralyzed man as well as being pretty low, 
on the totem pole of Israelite righteousness and holiness. Which ought to cause us to think for a moment about who is pretty low on the totem pole for us. Who are the people that we might put in the same category? Now, um, you know, I know that it's not a joyful occasion for me when I call the Canada Revenue Agency, but I certainly don't consider them to be traitors to their nation, and I'm pretty sure that they're not able to skim off uh, the top. But there are people who do that kind of thing in a different way, Think about loan sharks. Think about those, those businesses that we see here and there and everywhere, those, those payday loan people, those people who, who skim off uh, tons of money from people who, who really can't afford it, who charge exorbitant interest rates to poor people who are trying to get by. Or think about Think about those companies that own the credit cards that we use and how much interest they're taking off there. Or think maybe closer to home, maybe more real people. You know, maybe there are people in our village or in our neighborhood who <clears throat> we strongly suspect that they do a lot of drugs or we see them going to um, the liquor store every day to pick up their alcohol, or they, um, they don't seem to take care of their house or themselves, or they live, they live in a way that is foreign to us, or, or, or maybe, Maybe it's people who have a different sexual orientation from what we are used to or know about. Do we look at them as the lowest of the low? And of course, you know, the question then is begged, should we look at them that way? Jesus' actions would indicate sort of a yes and no. I mean, Jesus doesn't deny that these people have sins that need to be forgiven. In fact, Jesus is very clear that he forgives the sins of the paralyzed man, and then he heals that man. But think about this reality, too. Jesus, when he is speaking to the Pharisees, in verse 17, he says, It is not the healthy who need the doctor, but the sick. I have, come, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And that might make it sound like Jesus is not calling the Pharisees because it sounds like he's acknowledging that they are the righteous and that these, the Levi and his friends, the sinners and tax collectors, that they are the, the, the sinners that Jesus has come to heal and to call. Except that doesn't bear out when we look at the rest of scriptures. The reality is, is that Jesus is saying that these people, the sinners and tax collectors, as you call them Pharisees, these people acknowledge their sickness, and they have come to me, and they are seeking the doctor, the medical help, the, the healing, the forgiveness of God. Whereas you Pharisees, elsewhere he calls them whitewashed tombs, you Pharisees pretend to have it all together, and yet you are filled with sin as well. 
In fact, of course, when we look at scriptures as a whole, we realize that there, there is nobody who is righteous. There's no human being except for Jesus who has ever really truly been righteous except through the grace of God. Paul says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so what is Jesus really saying? Well, he's saying a couple of things. First of all, he is saying, look, at least they acknowledge their brokenness and their need for healing and forgiveness. And so I am here for them because they need me and they know they need me and they are willing to accept me. And maybe you need to examine yourselves on that. But then secondly, he is also calling into question our values and the values of the Pharisees. They ask, why does Jesus hang out with the sinners and the tax collectors? Why is he eating with them? And sometimes we do the same thing. Goodness, we don't even ask sometimes because we assume that you as a Christian, that me as a Christian, that us as good Christian people, upstanding citizens, ought not to hang out with sinful people. You got to be careful what friends you make, right? They might be a bad influence on you. They might somehow corrupt you. But that's not what Jesus models. Jesus does not model in his teaching his disciples how to fish for people. He does not model for them hanging around only with the right people, the good people. In fact, Jesus mostly seems to focus his ministry on the people who live on the fringes of society. So who do you and I hang out with? Do we hang out only with people like us? good Christian folk? Or do we, like Jesus, know that because we too are called to fish for people, and based on how Jesus fished for people, we need to hang out with anybody and everybody. We need to show them the love of God, no matter what their situation. Now, we need to quickly get on to the second part of the last half of this, where <clears throat> Jesus is questioned about fasting, and it is discovered that Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. And really, this this fits under the category of, yes, Jesus' sovereignty, his qualifications, the reality that he is indeed the Son of Man, but also the reality that there is joy in his presence. <clears throat> and that's what we're going to focus on here. The reality that when Jesus is with us, we must celebrate. Now, I know it says in, the, in verse 20, the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. And certainly there is very much a reality in which Jesus is not with us physically present in the same way that he will be when he returns again, or, nor is he here in the same way that he was physically with the disciples in this story. However, it is also true that the Holy Spirit lives within us, 
and that Jesus, through the Spirit, is present with us as well. And so we are in what theologians call an already not yet sort of phase of history. It is already true that Jesus has won the victory and lives within our hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit, and yet it is not yet what it will be when we are together with Jesus face to face when he returns and makes all things new. And so today, today we have Christians who will practice both fasting and celebrating. In a way, we see that almost every Sunday when we get together, we have a time of confession and assurance, a time where we, we as it were, we repent. Well, not as it were. We legitimately, hopefully, repent, and we mourn and grieve our sins, and a time where we receive and acknowledge that forgiveness, it's almost like confession and assurance is a little picture of fasting and celebration all in one, right? And then, of course, we see that when, when we do other things like communion. And, and we see that in, in holy and righteous brothers and sisters who practice fasting for spiritual reasons and in those who bring joy and celebrate, those same holy brothers and sisters who do that as well. Regardless, there's an important reality here, is that Jesus did not just come to do serious business of fishing for people and, and, and healing the sick in a way that is joyless and businesslike and full of only out of obligation action. Oh no. We often think of Jesus as being constantly serious. And I don't know, you know, fully what Jesus' sense of humor might have been like on this earth. But it is clear over and over and over again, Jesus talks about the importance of joy and celebration and that him being there is a cause, the cause for celebration and joy. We can see that also in this Sabbath story, right? Jesus says very clearly, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath, right? Okay, you're getting it all wrong, Pharisees. You're all about the serious interpretation of all of the details of the law and, and like, uh, give it a break, Recognize that the Sabbath was a gift to you. <coughs> Excuse me. The Sabbath is a gift. It's supposed to bring joy and peace and rest. Not burden people with more rules. Forgiveness healing, and joy. If we, brothers and sisters, can do our fishing, whether it's spear fishing or bait fishing or net fishing or trawling, if we can do our fishing with all of it suffused in forgiveness, healing, and joy, then we will have learned a huge part of what it means to fish for people. So, brothers and sisters, let us pray that not only will we know for ourselves Jesus' forgiveness and healing and joy in our lives, 
but also that we will send it out wherever we go to whomever we meet. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you so very much for this day. Thank you so very much for the reality that you, Jesus, when you walked on this earth with your disciples, you taught them about forgiveness and healing and joy. Oh God, help us as we fish for people, but also in our own lives, to see and hear and know the joy that we were sinners and are now forgiven, that we were sick and are now healed, that we were mourning and fasting without you, God, and now we have the joy of your presence each and every day. May we not only live with that reality in our souls, in our hearts, and in our minds, but may we also Spread that joy, that forgiveness, that healing, wherever we go, in your name and through the power of your Spirit, we pray. Amen.